Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. My name is Katira Noviello Kapoor. I am the Senior Director of Health Promotion, Wellness, and Athletics here at the 92nd Street Y. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Larissa Geskin with us to discuss the topic of skin cancer and prevention. This is the last cancer health education talk in the series of four hosted by the 92Y May Center for Health, Fitness, and Sports new initiative, Spark Your Health along with the Hyman Brown Senior Program. Um, so I would, the other person you're seeing on the screen here, I would like to turn it over to her, our Associate Director of the Hyman Brown Senior Program, Elizabeth Tarr. And I wanna thank her for all of her support and collaboration in, in helping us pull together these cancer health education talks. I think they've been extremely valuable to our community um, and really evergreen as we are posting them on our website so they can be viewed over and over again as needed to share this important information. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Katira. And it's been such a pleasure to work with, with you and with your whole department on really bringing health and wellness back to our members after the pandemic and after so many people really had to take a break from focusing on basic health and wellness um, throughout the two years that our lives were turned upside down. So I just wanna say a huge thank you to Dr. Gaskin for being here today. And I also wanna say a very special thank you. I don't know if she's on, but to my wonderful friend and colleague, Karen Schmidt, who's the director of the Manhattan Cancer Services Program at Columbia Presbyterian uh, Medical Center. Karen is a wonderful health advocate. She's an incredible nurse and she's taught me and so many people I have worked with through the years so much about maintaining health, attending to your health and advocating for your health. So thank you to Karen, if you're listening, thank you to Dr. Geskin. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Geskin. Thank All you right, to everyone thank you. for being here. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to bring Dr. Geskin in so that I can give her wonderful introduction. Um, first, just a quick housekeeping note. Um, we, of course, will take plenty of time for question and answer. We want to encourage questions throughout the entire length of this discussion. Um, so please feel free to use the chat box. If you're typing your questions into that chat box, I will be moderating and I will make sure to you know, raise my hand and pause Dr. Geskin at the appropriate time. Or you can feel free to raise your hand virtually and I'll make sure to unmute you at the, at the proper time to at, verbally ask your question. So with that being said, um, I, Dr. Gaskin, thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. Larissa Gaskin is a professor of dermatology and medicine at Columbia University Medical Center and director of the Comprehensive Skin Cancer Center in the Department of Dermatology. She is a world-renowned specialist in the diagnosis and management of cutaneous lymphomas and other cancers of the skin. Her other areas of expertise include melanoma screening, prevention, medical and surgical therapy, and management of high risk for skin, skin cancer populations. Dr. Geskin is using state-of-the-art methods in melanoma screening and surveillance, including mole mapping and dermoscopy. She was involved in development of novel melanoma detection methods, including MeliFind, among others. Dr. Geskin's team aims to provide multidisciplinary care to skin cancer patients, to conduct cutting edge clinical and basic science research, and to train medical students, residents, and fellows in the area of cutaneous oncology. She is a diplomat of the American Academy of Dermatology, member of the Society for Investigative Dermatology, the International Society for Cutaneous Lymphomas, and US C Cutaneous Lymphomas Consortium. She authored hundreds of peer-reviewed articles in the field of cutaneous oncology. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Katera, for your kind introduction and uh, thank you for having me today. It's my pleasure to be here to tell you uh, a little bit about skin cancer prevention. I'll share my screen and uh, what we can do to help us to prevent skin cancers and maybe detect them early so we avoid any problems uh, with um, skin cancer in the future. So um, we'll start with a very brief introduction uh, about melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. And actually, as you can see here, melanoma of the skin is a common cancer among women and men, and it lags behind uh, the other 
um, cancers such as breast, lung, colon um, cancer, but it's still a pretty big uh, health problem in, in the world, not just in the United States. One of the things that you need to understand about the melanoma is that, as you can see here, those curves for many cancers are trending down and melanoma is actually on the rise in men and in uh, women. And there are many cases, so almost 100,000 cases of melanoma being diagnosed in a uh, country every year. It's very costly to treat the cancer. So it's not only costing lives, it also costs uh, lots of dollars. And this is actually a last uh, update, which is old. I think uh, now it probably doubles that because since 2011, we have developed novel therapies. And some of those therapies are uh, very expensive. And so they are not uh, necessarily as, as uh, um, you know, they, they're way better therapies than we had in the past, but they certainly have a significant price tag. So um, we probably doubled $8 billion in 2018. So why, uh, why do we have a, um, a melanoma epidemic at this time? So I blame Coco Chanel for, for this craze that we have because um, before 1920s, before early 20th century, being tan was not associated with glamor, but in 1920s, Coco Chanel went to the French Riviera and came back with a chic tan. And since that time, it was thought to be chic to be tan. And so, uh, soon enough, uh, the bikini were introduced and then commercial tanning centers started. And so it really went up from there. And so UV exposure went up from beginning of 20th century. But why? Uh, you see, this is uh, how the famous artists portrayed uh, sun exposure in the past and whether it was Seurat or it was uh, uh, Renoir or American um, painters, but you can see 19th century, beginning of 20th century, um, people were actually portrayed under the umbrellas in the shade, protecting themselves from the sun, but it all changed since Coco Chanel's day. But why, uh, why did we, uh, actually were okay with that for a while? Well, there are several reasons. One of them, we didn't really realize what kind of harms uh, are inherited, uh, in, you know, what kind of harm uh, UV exposure possesses, but also what kind of harm um, lack of exposure to UV rays may have. And if you look at that Velasquez paint, painting, very famous painting by Velasquez, you can see this child with a very pale face and very prominent, we call it bossing, forehead as are these paintings, adults and children. Those are signs of rickets. And so certainly the sun has not only negative but also positive effects and i would like to address it a little bit to talk about good and bad that the sun carries and what we can do about this so one of the causes of rickets uh, or the main cause of rickets is actually vitamin d deficiency and in the past uh, people who were not exposed to the sun uh, frequently we're developing rickets. And uh, vitamin D is very important, not only for our bones and teeth, but it also was shown to be beneficial for other cancers, such as breast, colon, prostate, ovaries, and many other cancers. It also reduces your risk of diabetes, heart attack, rheumatoid arthritis, and other conditions. And we also know that even though in the United States, since very, um, I think 1950s, uh, since uh, fortification of food with vitamin D, there's still not enough vitamin D that gets to our body. And so we also know that outdoor sun exposure is not sufficient to provide that uh, vitamin D. 
and especially in our latitudes, especially in the winter. And so the fact is we do not get enough vitamin D from the sun. And so what to do? So as we know, vitamin D has several forms. And one of the forms that is actually active and the ones that you should take is called cholecalciferol. It's a vitamin D3. It's a special type of a molecule that is actually absorbed through the stomach and improves our vitamin D uh, levels in the body. And it can be stored in the liver and other organs and we can release it as needed. But we definitely need to take this particular form of vitamin D. And so when you are in the stores, you have to look for cholecalciferol or vitamin D3. Skin cancer prevention is very important. Why we're jumping to, from vitamin D to skin cancer prevention? Because as I mentioned, you know, uh, you can get vitamin D from the sun. The uh, UV rays convert pre-vitamin D that is located in our sun to another precursor that then travels to kidneys and is being converted to the active form of uh, uh, vitamin D. However, I will show you that UV exposure is associated with increased risk of skin cancer and melanoma, the deadliest one of all. And um, because of all this craze with UV exposure, now we're seeing an epidemic of skin cancers and melanoma, not only in our country, but also in the world. And so the uh, few years back, the Surgeon General called for action to prevent skin cancer included increased sun protection in outdoors, but also in indoors. Uh, it also included some educational activities. It also provided some funding to strengthen the research and improve surveillance and monitoring of skin cancer. So going back to childhood, uh, many people come to see me and I tell them, oh, your skin is so sun damaged. And they are very surprised to hear this. Um, some people even feel offended. They say, well, I am actually not on the sun practically at all. I am always protecting myself now. But actually, the most harmful race, the most harm harmful exposures to the sun happens before age of 18. And there are many reasons why it is. Of course, kids' skin is much thinner. It's just forming. But also, kids spend more time outdoors. So they, in general, get more sun exposure than adults. And so this is an unquestionable risk factor for skin cancer and melanoma. In addition, there are tanning beds that are used to provide tanning in addition to the natural UV light. And actually, uh, teenagers are uh, frequently using or used to use uh, tanning beds. We actually, at Columbia University, had an initiative to change the um, laws that would prohibit kids, teenagers, to use tanning beds before age of 18 because it's so unhealthy for them. It's just as unhealthy for your skin as smoking for your lungs. And so this is um, something that we were really pushing through and we were very excited when the New York State Legislature accepted the proposal from one of the congressmen and supported our initiative and actually um, signed it into the law couple of years ago. So now teenagers should not be able to receive tan from tanning beds uh, because it's prohibited in New York State. So let's talk about prevention. So there are different types of melanoma prevention. And um, uh, there are primary prevention, which is behavioral change and there are secondary prevention, which is early intervention. And uh, we will talk about it a little bit in more details, but behavioral change, it's public campaigns to educate um, 
uh, people's activity, people's uh, modification of patients, so people's lives, uh, basically some protection before you create the um, need for uh, removal of spots. So in, in other words, primary prevention is something that uh, stops UV from shining on your skin. It can be uh, either sunblock or just protective clothing or shady structures or whatever it is to prevent UV exposure in the first place. And so secondary prevention is early intervention when you're already sun exposed and you have other risk factors and we are there for you to protect, uh, pr provide that secondary prevention as cancer screenings and uh, to detect cancers early to decrease the uh, number of skin cancer and possibly um, improve mortality. So primary prevention, needless to say, is the most important thing. And so we are really trying to educate and that's why I'm here today because this is the most important thing that we can do for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. And this is something that may limit UV exposure before irreversible damage occur. And so sun exposure and sunburn are two major modifiable risk factors for melanoma. And there are at least, you know, in different studies, at least 65 to 90% in some studies, melanomas that can be attributed to UV radiation. And so we know for sure that uh, UV exposure is a um, risk factor for melanoma. And so given the dangers of melanoma, I think we really have to spread the world and the word and uh, educate our friends and our family on protection of, from UV rays. And again, as I mentioned before, yes, vitamin D, this is one of the arguments that people convey to me when um, the um, issue of sun exposure comes up. And as I mentioned to you before, you cannot get enough vitamin D from the sources. And actually you cannot get enough vitamin D from UV lights either. You'd really need to take a supplement and I showed you which one. Uh, by the way, I would like to make it interactive. And so if there are any questions uh, that comes up, um, you can uh, go ahead and uh, put them in chat, raise your hand and we can try to address your questions as they come. And so um, what are the challenges? Why can't we implement sun protective behaviors? And there are so many problems with the data, with the information that is being conveyed to the public. And uh, needless to say, it's sometimes very confusing. Uh, so what about sunscreens? Let's talk about sunscreens. Are sunscreen good? Or there were some articles that showed that sunscreen may be not so good for you. So what, what what's the right answer? So I think I will try to address it as, as we look at the data and see what actually the answer is to this question. Again, concern for vitamin D deficiency and concern for ingredient safety and chemical sunscreens and concern for environment. You know, can we swim wearing all this toxic uh, uh, sunscreen and not damage the environment around us? So we'll try to address all of these issues. Again, primary prevention. I did mention some of these uh, things. I will just skip that slide. So I'm jumping to sunscreens and I will try to address the issue of safe versus not safe sunscreens because as you might have heard, there was a big um, issue recently coming out in many papers about safety of sunscreens. And so in general, sunscreens are divided into mineral sunscreens and chemical sunscreens. Mineral sunscreens contain minerals such as zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, and they act as physical barriers that reflect and scatter UV light. They actually form a 
kind of a shield on your skin protecting you from uv light and that's why they are so powerful in protecting having said that you still have to have enough of those minerals in the sunblock because if you have three or five percent of zinc oxide in your sunblock it may not be enough to protect you from uv rays and so we do recommend mineral sunscreens but also the percentage of those sunscreens has to be high enough so it protects you sufficiently and you should reapply it as well so application once a day is not sufficient the chemical sunscreens act differently they absorb uv rays and they convert them into heat and so the FDA recently looked at the blood levels of certain chemical sunscreens and they found that certain sunscreens were absorbed in too high of a degree. Certain chemical sunscreens were absorbed to the blood and were found in the blood. And um, the question was, and and we don't know the answer to this question, but we know similar chemicals may be actually influencing certain endocrine functions. And so the question was of safety of certain chemical sunscreens, but not mineral sunscreens. Those are not absorbed. Those are really staying on the skin and protecting your um, skin from the sun. Um, now, as I mentioned, systemic absorption uh, was evaluated and those four ingredients were found avobenzone, oxybenzone, octacrylene, and ecamsul um, was uh, uh, found in plasma of patients and uh, uh, it was studied for toxicology. And so this is not usually what I recommend, even though the subject is controversial, but we have unquestionable, not controversial sunblocks that are very, very good. In the past, the cosmetics of sunblocks was called into question. Now there are nano emulsions. They are really uh, very thin preparations of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide that are very um, cosmetically elegant and nice to use. And I think uh, they can be used without having a white uh, kind of pasty skin. So um, they are certainly available and you can Google them and look for them. And we recommend at least 10% of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. It can be a mix, it can be one off, but certainly zinc oxide is a very safe ingredient. It's actually the same ingredient that contains in a baby paste, in like desitin, the, the diaper rash paste. And we know for many, many, if not hundreds of years, it was used safely in children. And so, so Dr. Genkin, if I could pause for just a moment, sure. because we do have some questions coming in. So some you might have been addressing somewhat, um, but someone just wants a little bit more clarification on sunscreen versus sunblock. There seems to be hundreds of choices and it's hard to pick. Um, they're saying, so is it chemical or mineral that's better? It seems like you're going in the direction of saying that mineral is certainly better, but maybe if we could just wrap that up into a summary for their question. Absolutely, yes. Uh, mineral is definitely better for many reasons. As I said, the absorption is much better. It uses safe ingredients such as zinc and titanium dioxide, and um, it's reflecting the light uh, rather than absorbing the light and converting it into heat. So definitely uh, our recommendation is to use mineral sunblocks. Now, the question about blocking versus screening, uh, it's somewhat kind of an eye of a beholder. I like to use the word sunblock because we would like to block the X-ray, uh, the, the, well, the X-ray, it's a UV rays is another type of radiation, UV rays. And this is something that we would like to um, use to protect um, the skin completely. And so we like to block it. Uh, they, these words are used interchangeably and um, there is no right or wrong with that. I, it's just my preference to use sunblock. It's my personal preference. Thank you so much. Um, we also have some questions on if you have a particular brand that you tend to recommend. Um, I don't uh, really endorse any particular brands. Um, if you go online, 
uh, you there are literally, like you said, hundreds of uh, sun blocks. The most common ones uh, also have now uh, sun blocks that contain zinc oxide in enough percentage. So you actually, uh, it's not enough for you to look at SPF. And actually, the sun blocks that I'm recommending they have SPF of 50 and more because. Um, Again, I don't have time to go into this because I want to show you a few other things that maybe you may like and may be important, uh, but certainly we can address it if you're interested. But uh, there is a difference between SPF of 30 and 50. And so um, people sometimes burn with SPF uh, of 30 and even SPF of 50. In the past, we, have, we had um, a assignment with SPF of 100. Now FDA basically removed it because it, they, they felt it was misleading. And again, there is a reason behind it, but uh, the main thing is that um, the more SPF, the better. And to get to that, a lot of SPF, you have to use uh, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide in concentration approaching 20%. So it's not enough to look at the front of the sunblock. It's important to look at the ingredients in the back of the sunblock. And I always advise my patients to go online because you can't really go over shelves very quickly and look at all the every single sunblock and look at the ingredients. But even brands like Neutrogena, Badger, um, you know, and any any brand now makes because they know any brand now makes uh, uh, good sunblocks. You just need to find the right ones. And uh, I think the easiest is online because you can actually um, enter whatever you want and you can price check and, and do it very quickly and efficiently. And I advise to buy small portions of sunblocks so you can try and see. Some people may have allergies to certain sunblocks. So buy a small portion, a small um, tubes of sunblock or small bottles of sunblock and try them first. See if you don't have an allergy or intolerance to particular sunblock. And if you're okay with that and you like it, you can always buy more. Thank you so much for clarifying that. All right. So we are uh, continuing on. And um, uh, just the education campaign that actually um, uh, it first was introduced in Australia. As you know, uh, this is something I didn't touch upon, but ozone layer is thinning above certain places. And actually, Australia has the thinnest ozone layer of all places, and they have the highest incidence of melanoma in the world. And so Australians very astutely uh, noticed that and start, uh, started to protect their citizens from UV rays in very at very early age, in children, in, in kindergarten children, even before kindergarten. They organized this campaign, that teaching campaign that was called Slip, Slop, Slap, Sick, Slide. And all of this stands for something either, uh, you know, slip on shirt, slap on head, slap on sunblock, sick shade. And basically it all um, promotes the behaviors that are sun protective. And I'm not going to do the whole thing because I am uh, copying the transcript. Uh, oh, okay. So it's, uh, I think, I think it's slip on shirt, slap on head, um, slap on, it may be the other way around, but slap on sunblock, seek shade. And I don't remember what slide stands for, but um, it's also one of the sun protective behaviors that uh, people uh, should try to um, implement to protect themselves from UV rays. And this campaign estimated to save uh, about, you know, thousands. And, you know, I can show you there is a, a 43,000 skin cancers and 1,400 deaths from skin cancer, but it probably is much more by now. And of course, when it prevents skin cancer, it also cost effective, it saves us healthcare money. So um, there are a number of emerging public health campaigns. Um, and one of them is something that we are trying to implement here. And so all of you are welcome to join our skin cancer action team for the Department of Health of New York State when um, we are trying to implement, and it's very difficult because the 
this uh, San Beatables program, which is an educational program for school children and kindergartners and day, daycare um, for, for little children. Uh, it's really hard to implement because we have to knock on every single door of every single school. There is no law that would make schools to implement this program. So this is what we're working on together with Department of Health. What about skin cancer screening? Now we're moving on to secondary prevention. So screening when you already had your sun exposure over the lifetime. Uh, the next step would be skin cancer screening. And you would think that this is a straightforward and very simple thing to do and to promote. And it turns out it's not so simple because um, it's really hard to do research like that and prove that skin cancer screening is saving lives and is uh, beneficial to find more cancers and prevent bad cancers from happening. There are a number of studies that were done poorly or were done incompletely or were done insufficiently. And so by now, believe it or not, we don't have a firm evidence short of few European studies that proves beyond doubt that skin cancer screening can prevent skin cancer. And so because of that, there are only few US workers have ever received skin examination in their lifetime. And so there are a number of consensus recommendations that are coming from specialists, but evidence-wise, we don't have it. So how do we do screening? There are many different ways how we can screen and actually what you can use at home to look at your skin. There are three examples of potential screenings and screening in a panel A here shows you, and it's called ugly duckling approach. It's a very simple way to look at the moles and ugly duckling approach showed here on a panel A is showing that people have one type of a mole and there is a mole that really stands out one mold that doesn't fit the pattern. The other panel shows, again, similar, like many different patterns, but all similar between each other. And all of a sudden there is a mold that doesn't fit any of those patterns, or there is a single mold. So if we see a single mold that looks a little atypical, sometimes it's a reason for worry. Not always, but sometimes. But this is a good way for you to remember how you can screen your skin and find that suspicious mole, suspicious lesion. And I have to say that most of the time when people come in, the lesions that they bring to me are benign and I'm as happy as they are to report to them that this spot is okay. But I would never put it on patient's shoulders to make that decision. And so if you have a question, I always advise people to come in and seek an, a professional advice. What else we can do to uh, screen for cancer? We use a uh, special technology called total body mapping, where we actually make a kind of world map of your skin and we we'll look those images to monitor our patients prospectively. We use it as a baseline where we take those pictures sometimes annually, sometimes every couple of years, depending on how much patients changed. And we use artificial intelligence tools and I'll just show you how it works. We use artificial intelligence tools, which can actually show us that there is a new or changing mole and we pay special attention to it. And all of the moles on two photographs taken a couple years apart, they can tell us what they are um, similar, if the moles are similar or the moles have changed or different. And again, most of the time, it's nothing to worry about and I'm happy to report uh, that the mole is benign, but sometimes we find very early melanomas like that. Dr. Gaskin, we have a quick question here. Um, just asking, is it always the case that you would see a potential ugly duckling or you know, could it not be visible to the eye? So uh, one of the things that I um, tell my patients is you have to do your part, right? So you have to look and you have to see what you see. I can tell you that what I see is very different from what you see because of my training, my specialty and uh, my experience. And so I can see more things 
into where you may not see things. But again, this is a uh, only um, professional opinion that I can provide to you. This is not something that can be um, done um you know by you so i cannot really teach you that you need to look at what you can see and bring it to me and then i can address it um, there are some melanomas that are very difficult to see there are some skin cancers that are very difficult to see but it's not uh, possible for us not to see um, something if something is wrong with the skin we do see those things and that's why skin cancer screening is so important there are melanomas and other actually uh, cancers that may arise on mucosal surfaces in the mouth, in the genital area, even vaginally, even uh, around the buttocks area. That's why we do full body check. When people come in, we look everywhere. And you should also look everywhere as well. And so for um, People who, and I hope everyone goes to the dentist, they can do mouth exam very thoroughly. Uh, for women, gynecological exam, you can ask your OBGYN person to look at the mucosal area, the vaginal area. This is where we cannot see. Uh, but other than that, if there is something wrong with the skin, we should be able to see it. We not. Uh, we cannot always say that there is something wrong with the skin. Sometimes we need to do a biopsy to prove that something is wrong or not wrong with the skin. And so sometimes we do um, mole biopsies or spots biopsies to see what they are. So we cannot always tell you by just looking. Thank you. That... Mm -hmm. um, should I continue? No more questions? Yes, you can continue. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so we discussed the um, mole mapping and uh, dermoscopy is another way how we can actually look at the moles. The, what's dermoscopy? Dermoscopy is the way which allows the special wavelength, special light to penetrate through the skin. So the reason I see more than you see is because I use dermoscopy and it allows me to see through the skin because the special light that I use actually goes through the skin and delivers that knowledge to me and I studied that subject I studied dermoscopy and so I know what those changes are and when I see through my dermatoscope I can actually make judgment about what those structures are and if they are dangerous or not and there are many different types of dermatoscopes and we use obviously state-of-the-art um, polarizing and non-polarizing dermatoscope to look at the moles. And we use this machine called a uh, mole mapping machine or um, uh, a photo finder, uh, the special brand to um, map our patients and to follow our patients. And we use digital dermoscopy to photograph special, you know, moles of concern. And what does it help us to do? Here you can see the dermoscopic picture of a mole that was taken a few months apart. And you can see the mole looked like that. And you would think, you know, it's a typical mole, but actually it's not a melanoma. It's just an atypical mole that do have a little bit, uh, that does have a little bit of a atypical shape. It has kind of two-toned and it's irregular to begin with, but not malignant. But look, if you compare this picture to this picture, it developed a little area that is a little thicker and a little bit more irregular. And this is where the early melanoma was. And so that's how we can tell. It also has a AI, artificial intelligence, that is built in. And by taking serial pictures, we can actually ask AI to help us to make that decision. And now we're developing new life microscopy and there are a number of laboratories in this country and actually it started to come to the practice it's called confocal microscopy it's actually when you can see live cells moving through and life imaging and you can actually see the pathology on the cellular level and you can discern very early um, findings to distinguish melanoma and other skin cancers. This is still investigational, but this is something that will be coming to the practice, I'm sure. So keep your eyes open for that. And um, 
And Dr. Gaskin, so sorry, we have one more question coming no, through. No worries, of course. Um, I might not pronounce this correctly, so I apologize. Is it better to treat a skin cancer lesion with the MOHS, the MOHS, or the laser surgery? Well, I have to say that laser surgery is rarely, rarely is the answer for, for skin cancer. Um, and there are many reasons behind it. Most surgery is not the only surgery that is used to treat skin cancer. Most surgery is a specialized type of surgery that we usually use on the face. Uh, it's a special tissue sparing procedure that basically makes sure that, you know, the skin is not um, removed um, indiscriminately on the face. But in other body parts, we do not use most surgery because we don't need to worry about eyes or nose or mouth or other structures on the face. And so we use a white local excision uh, for skin cancer treatment in other areas. I am not using la lasers for cancer removal and I don't think it's a good idea to, to do that. And in fact, if you do have skin cancer, um, if you have a pre-cancer or if you have a skin cancer that is not invasive, there are different ways how we can address that. But if you have invasive cancer, uh, there are really, um, there's no really a, the, th those two things are really not alternative. One is not acceptable for treatment of invasive skin cancer. And another one is acceptable, but only on certain areas of the body and certain types of cancer on other areas of the body. So it really is not a question that I can respond to, um, uh, you know, without knowing more details. Thank you so much. And so um, there are many different new tools that are being developed for detection of melanoma. And again, I just want to educate you that um, you may see them in the future. There are digital skin lesion analysis that is, again, using artificial intelligence to um, help us to make our decisions. And just wanted to bring uh, to you a few clinical examples how melanomas can look like and how they can be misdiagnosed. Um, like this melanoma, for example, was thought to be a tick bite or some kind of uh, bite. That person didn't realize that it wasn't uh, a bite, it was actually a melanoma, but they thought that uh, it wasn't. So when it wasn't resolving within a few months, uh, they uh, sought uh, advice and, and we found this to be melanoma. This person uh, thought that it was a bruise, uh, but in fact, it was a melanoma under the nail. This person thought it was just a freckle and he did have a freckle there for a long time, but it transformed into melanoma and um, he did not notice it. It was noticed on a regular exam. This person was treated for fungal infection of the nail and it turned out to be a melanoma, again, under the nail. It's very rare, but it can happen. And so I think one of the messages of this slide is that you should seek professional opinion on skin lesions, because again, even um, general doctors, they may not be educated enough to tell you what's what. Uh, this is a melanoma between the toes. And again, some, something that is very important when you look at your skin, the same way as we tell women, for example, to do your breast uh, exam once a month, uh, we tell our patients to look at their skin uh, once a month and look at, look at it head to toe and see kind of get to know your skin, get to know your moles, and see if there are any new or changing lesions. Um, and you have to look everywhere. You have to look between the toes, on your soles, where people never look. And we're happy to help you with that as well. And, and so once a year, I see my patients for whole body check. Again, just clinical pictures of how melanoma skin look differently. This was a young person who didn't realize that he had this melanoma growing on his temple. He had a mold there. That was an older lady who had been uh, working actually um, in, um, on a farm all her life. And she had a lot of exposure of her scalp. And she had this melanoma on the scalp. And um, this melanoma I put in just to demonstrate that not all melanomas all of the ABCD rules. And we know melanoma ABCD rule is 
A for asymmetry, and you can see this one is fairly symmetric. B is for border irregularity, and this is pretty regular. And color, even color, even though they, it looks like there are several colors, but it's more or less homogeneous. But what was important about this spot is that um, you know, its diameter is bigger than a centimeter, which is like double pencil erasers here. So when the mold grows big, it may be a reason to evaluate it. And another important letter in this ABCD soup is E, A, B, C, D, E. E is the most important letter and it means evolution or change. And change is the most important thing that you need to pay attention to. And this is again, another melanoma that is unusual it's a has what we call amelanotic part it does not look black this one looks blue so they can be all kind of uh, types of melanomas and so um, as i mentioned to you before um, in conclusion primary prevention through interventions such as sunscreen use public health campaigns and educational programs um, may hold that epidemic of melanoma and skin cancer that we see in this country. I do believe that skin cancer screening is a critical secondary intervention to achieve this goal and that um, the success of screening programs was demonstrated beyond doubt in uh, other countries, not United States, but in other countries such as Australia and Germany. And uh, even though there are certain groups that do not find sufficient evidence to recommend skin cancer screenings, skin cancer screenings really carry very little risk. And I feel that in this case, the benefit outweighs the risk. And so I do recommend that for all of my patients. And I would like to put a vitamin D question to rest by saying that you need to take supplement of vitamin D which is effective and safe, and you need to take it for many reasons beyond skin cancer. And so um, protecting yourself from UV lights and not forgetting to take vitamin D supplement is an effective way to prevent skin cancer without vitamin D deficiency. So um, with that, I would like to conclude. I think we're on time. And to say thank you for having me and take a few questions. We have a couple of minutes left. Yes, yeah, so we do have another question and thank you so much. I, this was just so educational. Um, I certainly have takeaways that I'll, I'll take from this. Um, so one question is that, is it always possible for us to prevent skin cancer um, through the methods that you mentioned of prevention or is there a possibility of hereditary risk for skin cancer? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, hereditary risks do exist but uh, they are not something we can modify. So the, your risk is what it is. And um, uh, there are other things that can be very important, such as exposure to HPV virus. And uh, uh, certain skin cancers are linked to HPV virus. So people who have warts, uh, HPV is a wart virus, um, whether it's genital warts or um, regular warts, uh, they may be at high risk for skin cancer. Uh, certain exposures, you know, we know wells water, for example, may contain some arsenic, and arsenic is linked to squamous cell carcinoma, obviously. And some other environmental exposures may be important, but there is no question uh, the heredity is very, very important. And I always ask my patients if they have any history of skin cancer or melanoma in their families. And um, if, the, if you do have that risk in your family, you may have genetic predisposition for skin cancer. Yes, absolutely. Um, I also haven't mentioned number just because we have only one hour to talk about all of these things. There are many different types of melanoma and there are types of melanoma that are not linked to UV exposure. There are types that arise in mouth and mucosal surfaces in palms and soles, they're not linked to UV exposure, but those melanomas are very, very rare. And 90% of melanomas are linked to UV exposure. Um, how much vitamin D do you suggest being taken daily? If you could just refresh us on that number. So this is a constantly moving target. This is something that actually changed since I started to practice. And in the past it was uh, 500 units, and then they, uh, 
increase it to 1,000 and 2,000. It actually depends, and um, this is something that you can address with your primary care physician because you need to check your vitamin D levels. And depending on your levels, they can recommend a certain dose. Because most people, I have to say, most people that I check are actually vitamin D deficient. And for them, you need to take obviously more vitamin D and you can take 2,000 um, uh, international units a day until you are reaching that steady state. Uh, or even more, some people recommend 10,000 units uh, once a week. So it really is something that I cannot address as a group. You need to be very specific and check your levels. Thank you. Um, also, one more great question here, I think, which is um, if you could speak a little bit about SPFs that are contained within um, uh, makeup products, like a, a concealer or like a cream, if you have any strong feelings on that, um, if it's if it's okay to double up and put on potentially that makeup cream and then put sunscreen on top of that as well? It's an excellent question, and I do have strong feelings about this. Um, the, uh, usually the cosmetic products do not contain enough uh, sun protection, and so it's perfectly okay to double up and put sunblock underneath your makeup. You can put a very thin layer of a good zinc oxide containing sunblock and put your makeup over it. Uh, again, you have to find the one that you're happy with and you like and doesn't dry your skin, doesn't irritate your skin. Uh, this is something that is your homework for today. And um, you can certainly put uh, makeup over it. No problem. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, I think those are all of the questions that we have for today. I cannot thank you enough for this uh, very informative discussion. And I will, um, I will have this archive available in the next 48 hours. So if anybody wants to go back and review, um, I can email this out and you can also find the presentation in our health and fitness um, archives on the 92nd Street Y website. So Dr. Geskin, thank you again for all of this amazing information. We really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Stay well. Bye-bye.